We are just about two minutes after start time, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the GFI Business of Alt Protein Monthly Seminar. My name is Audrey Gear, and I'm a startup innovation specialist here at the Good Food Institute. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, GFI is an international nonprofit organization that is developing the roadmap for sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. We identify the most effective solutions, we mobilize resources and talent, and we empower partners across the food system to make alternative proteins accessible, affordable, and most importantly, delicious. So please visit gfi.org to learn more about our work. Uh, before we begin today, a few housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, this seminar is recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, following today. A copy of the recording will also be emailed to all the registrants after the presentation. And you can also view um, our previous seminars on our YouTube channel. Uh, secondly, this seminar will include an audience Q&A in the last few minutes. Please ask your questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat. You are welcome to ask questions throughout, but we likely won't be able to address them until towards the end. Uh, and third, something I'm really excited about, immediately following the seminar at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern time, there will be, we will be hosting a virtual networking session via the MeetAway platform. Uh, we will drop the link in the chat here uh, that will take you to the registration page where you can sign up if you haven't already. Uh, and with this, it's a great opportunity to meet other professionals in the all protein industry. You'll be matched with about seven people over the course of an hour, and you'll have the option to exchange contact info afterwards if you do want to continue the conversation with anyone. Just remember, you do need to sign up via MeetAway to access the networking. And again, that is immediately following the seminar today. So with that, I am very excited to introduce our guest speaker today, Mike Schall. Mike is currently a managing partner at Focal Point, a middle market investment banking firm, where he is co-leader of their food and beverage practice. Prior to that, he was advisor and then senior principal of global growth and business development at Whole Foods Market. Uh, in those roles, he provided leadership on investments and acquisitions, new ventures, and strategic partnerships. Uh, Mike just has an incredible wealth of experience in the food sector, having served on boards and held C-suite positions in food companies for more than 30 years. Welcome, Mike. We're so happy to have you here with us today. Thanks. Thanks, Audrey. Very nice to be here with you at Good Food Institute. Thanks for hosting. Amazing. So to set some context... Uh, today, we're covering a pretty broad topic, which is how alternative protein companies can engage with retailers to get their products on store shelves and ultimately into the mouths of their customers. And today builds off of October's seminar, which was generally around building brand awareness. But today, we're focusing exclusively on the retail environment, where there are clearly a lot of tailwinds. Uh, for example, GFI spins retail sales data from April of this year shows that grocery sales of alternative proteins have grown a whopping 27% in the past year to reach $7 billion. And Mike, you clearly have a lot of experience in the retail space, having been executive at Whole Foods and, of course, experiencing it from the other side uh, by driving the success of CPG companies in the space. So in your experience, what are the fundamentals that you think alternative protein entrepreneurs and startups should really first know or think about when beginning to sell into a retail channel? You know, what consideration should they keep in mind when deciding if this is the right channel for them? Well, uh, that's a that's a very um, encompassing question, Audrey. Thank you. Um, you know, I always think of this concept, and there's a ton of tailwind uh, right now and enthusiasm around plant based foods like never before. So, um, you know, where are you on your journey in these products? Um, that. And again, I don't want to be too pedestrian in terms of the level and scope of the activity of the uh, attendees, but depending on where you are on that journey, uh, it's going to require a lot of um, energy and focus to, to build out that plan. So I always ask, you know, for the specific product features and benefits, what is the point of difference that you offer, but most importantly, what's the point of preference? It's great to have a point of difference for a product, and you can see that in basic attributes that are um, part of the elements of plant-based foods, but what is your point of preference? Why is a consumer going to choose your brand or your product over someone else? So, um, and, and the other thing, of course, is are you really sure you wanna do this? And I, I mean that I'm half in jest, but the reality is 
you're in the game now, there are a lot of different channels with which to sell your product in, mostly brick and mortar, mostly direct to consumer. But each of those, uh, Audrey, each of those channels has their cost, right? And um, whether it's brick and mortar and the supply chain with that, or whether there are costs in launching on, on D2C. So I, I think in general, um, what I would say to folks is, what is your point of difference? What is your point of preference? And are you really prepared? Do you really want to do this? And if you do, let's be aware of the challenges of each of those channels as you go forth in building your brand. Great. Thanks for that, Mike. And, um, you know, in our earlier conversations that we had leading up to this, you, you spoke about the importance of a brand destination statement. Uh, right. This concept is also one that came up in October. You know, our panelist, Elizabeth Alfonso, in that seminar really stressed the importance of having a really strong brand deck and a strong foundation about what your brand is all about. And so right. I was wondering if you could explain how you think about a brand destination statement and how that really helps you communicate with your customers. Sure, sure. happy to. So um, there, there are really three elements of brand destination. One is positioning, one is copy and, and development, and the other is the actual destination. And in this instance, um, the brand destination statement, and, and I, I loved Elizabeth's documentation on the deck and how you go about building a brand deck, which could be used for investment, it could be used for uh, sharing information with retailers, but the brand destination statement precedes all of that. And what I mean by that is um, you, you really need to home in on the advertising, on the uh, positioning, the copy development, and the destination, ultimately where you want this business to be. And this template will be made available to our, our online uh, colleagues. But in essence, this document drives all of the communication about your brand. It will drive documentation and communication about the deck. It will drive communication to manufacturing and co-manufacturing. It will drive um, communication to your advertising and those that are communicating your brand. So the essence of this is sort of a, of a really condensed planning document to make sure that you capture the positioning, the ethos, and the exact destination. Because without focus, you can't have point of difference. And without point of difference, you can't have point of preference. Just one follow-up question on this. When you're developing your brand destination, is this something that you revisit over and over again? Or is this something, is this a living document or, or is this something that you should um, really just set in stone and set as your foundation? Well, in terms of the brand itself, what, once, you, once you have identified the brand and the positioning, that really is sort of a permanent fixture. Um, depending on how you communicate and the destination, that may change. So for example, we'll see in a moment, the way people think about and, and refer to plant-based foods, that may be evolving. And true to form, it is evolving over time. Um, but I don't think the positioning and the destination really ever changes. Um, if we did that, we'd kind of be, you know, it's almost like bumper bowling, right? We'd be throwing a ball down the alley and it would be bouncing off the, the uh, gutters in order to get a pin down or attract a consumer. So I think brand destination, brand positioning is here to stay. It is what it is. Great. And so when a brand is thinking about selling into a retail channel, where do those end consumers really come into consideration? What do you think companies really need to know about their customers? And how should they be thinking about their customers via the retail channel specifically? That, that's... Uh... Well, let's, let's, as they say, go to the next stage here. So we always want to be cognizant of the trends and perceptions and interests in plant-based products. And GFI has done a world-class job of articulating, making that data available through its partnership with SPINs and other, and other retailers. But um, as we proceed through this um, to, the, to the next page, we know that shoppers are very, very familiar with a wide range of what we call claims. In certain retailers, in my days at Whole Foods Market, we used to call them attributes. And those attributes are identifying what these products stand for and the product attributes and, and features that they have. Plant-based awareness and familiarity was ranking equally as high almost with organic and natural foods and non-GMO. So there is a high level of familiarity with the plant-based claim in, in foods today. 
And then how that rate relates to your question about how it relates to the consumer is when you mention top of mind meaning to plant of plant-based, it, it it varies and it generally lands in one of these five general areas, which is vegetables, uh, vegan. I happen to be vegan, very plant-based. So the inclination there is to have no ingredients made from meat or animal protein or animal products. Um, in, in other definitions, it's more uh, stringent, no meat or animal products. In soy, that could be a whole pod in and of itself and natural. Natural claims, as we all know, um, are all over the board. But when you mention top of mind or when you mention plant-based, top of mind, these are the five general areas that consumers uh, mention. And interestingly enough, very little no animal products uh, in, in these. And then moving forward again, in terms of purchase interest, which is again, getting back to your question about launching into, into the uh, consumer marketplace, grocery, online, or direct to consumer, interest in purchasing plant-based or foods with this claim is very high. It's as high as organic and natural and, and almost as high as being local, which is another um, area of energy and tailwind now. So um, when you look at plant-based, it ranks certainly a lot higher than vegan because vegan uh, was a, at a point in time, something that was um, uh, both ethical and nutritional as a product. So we're, we're looking at plant-based ranking very high among purchase interests. Moving on to uh, attribute agreement where people agree or disagree, whether they're interested in plant-based foods or whether they're committed to plant-based foods. You can see in this chart that, that um, there's a high level of energy around better health, um, the ability to lose weight. Uh, I think we're seeing other things like energy uh, efficiency and sustainability move up over these basic attributes that are for, for example, our foods for someone like me that relate to plant-based foods or veganism. So these are general attribute agreement on what, again, interested people, people that are interested in plant-based foods, and committed consumers that are committed to plant-based foods. This manifests itself in top of mind awareness and what plant-based features and benefits are when you mention plant-based foods. It's no surprise from the previous slide and other information, we're seeing a lot of energy around health, a lot of energy around natural. Um, it's, it's healthier, requires less energy to produce. And I think, again, from, from when this research was done to today, we're seeing tremendous energy around ESG, right? Environmental sustainability and, and governance on how products are produced, how they are produced ethically and how important they are to the environment being plant-based. So along with all those good things come the challenging things, right? So what are barriers to entry in, in this space? Or what are preventing your consumers from exploring your brands and, and adopting and generating trial? And we see, again, four basic areas which are evolving constantly. They used to be perceived, plant-based foods were perceived as, as expensive and more expensive. Um, the ability to find uh, plant-based products, which as we all know in the last couple of years has exploded. So there is much, much more uh, availability for products in mainstream supermarkets in addition to supernatural retailers. Um, some things that are, uh, that are less, um, uh, there's less energy around the change there is, is the, uh, the ability for the entire family to eat plant-based. Many, my, my, my family is not vegan. Um, they're, they're very plant forward and plant slanted, but, but they're not vegan. And of course the desire for many people to supplement their diet with meat. So all of these getting back to, and I think we have one more word cloud and, and another chart, um, but, but all of these are focusing on your question, Audrey, which is when launching into the, into the marketplace, uh, whether it's grocery or online, these are the kinds of things we need to keep in mind. And, and so, yes, as we, as we go into categories that are of interest to consumers, this is a very quick ranking among a sample size of around 500 shoppers. You can see that snacks and nutrition bars have always ranked high. In my experience, it's been a very active space for plant-based foods, but with more and more technology, you're seeing frozen meals ready to eat and, and absolutely fabulous meat uh, analogs and dairy analogs that are taking the market by storm. 
Great. And for, you know, everyone in the audience, I do just want to reiterate, we will be sharing these slides uh, following the presentation today. And I also wanted to make sure that everyone's aware that GFI also has a great deal of consumer insights and guides about marketing plant-based proteins. Um, this includes guidance on some primary drivers for purchasing those plant-based products, category language and labeling, and some shopper marketing tips. Uh, very similar to what you were just talking about, Mike, taste is a huge driver of what interests consumers in these products. Um, yeah. Shifting directions a little bit, mm -hmm. can we talk about distribution? You know, distributor distributors can help CPG brands, you know, get into those regional chains, um, get into independent grocers. And I would assume that strong data from those smaller retailers would really lay the foundation for a pretty compelling pitch for a larger player like Whole Foods. But what are the pros and cons that brands should be aware of when working with distributors? Well, as you started to say shift direction and talk about distribution, I was going to say, do we have to? Um, but but we do. It's it's a it's an essential and critical part of getting the product to market. And I'm being a little facetious, but it, it is I arguably the most challenging part of getting your products to market. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that, but but I would say that in general, there are many different types of distributors. And the three that come to mind, the top of mind, and many of you, uh, of course, in North America and some from Europe and around the world understand that up in, in the States, we have um, two very large supernatural distributor groups. And one, one of those is United Natural Foods, the other is KE Foods. And they typically service all kinds of retailers, independents, chain, and supernaturals. Um, they're large-scale distributors, and they cover, you know, and have 30 to 40,000 products, if not more. Then there's the DSD distributors, and those are called direct store delivery or DSD, and they typically cater to either shorter shelf life or ready-to-drink beverage categories. For those of you that are looking at exploring um, plant-based keepers and 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 beverages that are plant-based that are need uh, short shelf life refrigeration. And then, and then there are the regional distributors. And those regional distributors are just a smaller version of some of the larger um, general grocery distributors. But you have to remember in, in our business, the distributor is really only the message, the messenger, the messenger. And, and in, order, in order for your products to get to market, you have to have a retailer that's generally eager and, and encouraged to take the product. So there are a lot of pros and cons uh, to food distribution. But uh, this distri the distributors are really vital, um, whether they're distributing to uh, grocery stores, brick and mortar, or whether they're aggregators that are working with direct to consumer. Um, I know you're going to ask me, what are the pros and cons, right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So as I mentioned a moment ago, the, the distributor is the messenger. So let's let's not you know punish them too much for the challenges that they have to deal with, particularly today with supply chain issues, um, increases in the cost of fuel, um, labor shortages. Um, most recently, you know, this has taken a big, big toll on distributors. Having said that, the real advantages of working with a distributor are that they have tremendous reach and frequency, right? So they reach out a whole lot of retailers, but again, it's incumbent upon you, the brand owner, to make sure that you gain distribution and have the product in the marketplace that the distributor is being asked to carry. A lot of people think it's the other way around. You have a distributor carry your product and they go out and sell for you. That's not the case. You sell the product, the distributor drops it off at the store or it's part of a merchandising program. Distributors also have what they call sales service representatives. And those SSRs are like brand managers and they will help you as an entrepreneur, as an early stage brand, sort of navigate the ins and outs of that distribution challenge. It's, it's very challenging, or it can be very challenging. And then thirdly, um, it's depending on the size of the retailer that they're servicing, their margin points uh, may, may be more efficient, right? So they're, they're more efficient and effective because they have scale as opposed to DSD distributors and smaller distributors that have to charge a higher margin. Now the cons. Um, and this is where we all feel a little bit of the pain, unfortunately. It's very costly to work with distributors. And what I mean by that is if you have a working capital or a cash flow requirement, it takes inventory. It takes inventory typically in multiple distribution sites. 
and and it also requires enough of your working capital to withstand the time until you get paid by the distributor for your goods and services. It's very costly in samples. It can be very costly in advertising programs. You're going to pay promotion allowances. And um, even, even when you're doing scan-based promotions in retailers, it requires some form of an allowance to a distributor. And then um, payment terms. Typically, uh, you'd love to be paid in 30 days, 210 at 30. Oftentimes, it's a lot longer. And unfortunately, when you do receive the check, there are deductions. So, you know, I wouldn't say the cons outweigh the pros. They're sort of the necessary evils in building distribution and maintaining your product in the market. I hope that answered that question, Audrey. Absolutely. And I just wanted to kind of double click into a few of the things that you just mentioned. Um, sure. Obviously, there are some cons here with costs. Uh, obviously, margins are also hugely important for the success of a business. So how should brands really be thinking about these costs and the different margins that they're, they, they're, they should be expecting um, working through a distribution partner? And, and how does that really compare from selling B2B or D2C? Well, um, margins ultimately begin and end with profitability of the business. So gross profit is key. And uh, that incorporates cost of goods and freight that is the amount that you have left over to promote the brand. Um, whether this is a direct consumer business or whether it is a brick and mortar business, margin requirements are really key for the brand owner to afford the ability to sell and market the product. Margins and retailers um, typically require by category anywhere between 30 to 40% markup. That's what the retailer is going to add before they reach the retail price. And then working back from that, typical manufacturer is going to need anywhere from, I mean, ideally 50% or more, but it's generally in the high 30s to 40s um, and, and perhaps in that area. That's gonna be the minimum amount over time, over time that you're going to need to promote and sell the product and build some infrastructure. Um, early on, typically early stage companies with lesser volume using COPAC resources don't have those margins. So it's important to have working capital and some cash because generally speaking, a company's gonna burn cash for the first year of its life, maybe even longer, depending upon how quickly um, consumers try and adopt and repeat purchase the product. So I'm not sure that answered your question. There's really three levels of margin. There's gross profit, which is what the brand has to spend. There's the margin that distributor takes also, which can be anywhere from a contract fixed price for a large chain to a double digit markup. And then there's that margin markup that occurs before you hit actually the suggested retail price. Well, it certainly sounds like uh, these margins are something that companies really need to be aware of and to keep track of. Otherwise they could get them into some trouble. Yeah, it's uh, it's always, and, and part of that is driven by the, the retailer's strategy, right? What they need to make off products in order to attract the right shoppers into their stores and, and what and how to fill that shopping basket. Absolutely. And we do have a few questions about this in the chat that I do want to address right now. Um, so okay. someone's asking about direct distribution and does a startup really even need to go through a distributor? Um, and then a follow-up to that is, is 30% customer margins, um, is that conditional? Well, let me, let me take the first question. If you're gonna sell direct, um, that's great as an emerging business in a particular geographic region, right? Because those sales resources require money, whether you're gonna be driving a truck or someone's gonna be driving a truck for you or, or, or actually out selling the product directly. It has to get to the warehouse for a retailer and from the retailer the warehouse, it has to get to the store. If it's a smaller independent, you want to start on a smaller scale, direct selling is great. And a lot of a lot of retailers love to see the entrepreneurs. They love to see people that are actually the creator and the seller and the, of the brand and the product. So no issues there, but as you grow and scale, obviously direct selling requires a tremendous amount of physical and, and human capital in order to do that. Um, 30 percent margins for retail, I would say that it is very, very category dependent. And the reason it's category dependent is if, if it's shelf stable, 
category margins don't vary a lot, right? Because there's no shrink, there's no spoilage. The, the, the more you veer into shorter shelf life, the higher the margins are, because until and unless that inventory is controlled effectively at a retailer, there's gonna be some expiration, right? They're gonna be out of code and the retailer's not gonna pay for that, we pay for that. So um, it's, it's kind of a challenge. I would say that 30% is a good benchmark, but it varies category by category. Got I it. Hope that, hope that answered that question. I think so. And um, I'm glad to hear you mention the word category, which is leads me to my, my next question for you, which is that many startups spend a lot of time thinking about, and of course, planning for a category review. Mm -hmm. Can you describe how a category review works? how to best prepare for one? Like what are retailers looking to see in this? Well, uh, category reviews are, um, that's, that's really one of the most challenging areas of retail, particularly in the last couple of years because most grocers have not actually been seeing people face to face. Category reviews for those that may not understand uh, or, or have a comprehension of what that is, is essentially a time where products are reviewed um, they're accepted into the supply chain and then they're distributed ultimately at the store. Typically, a category review is done six to nine months and maybe even a year in advance of uh, actual shelf distribution. The reason for that is some of them are seasonal, products are seasonal. The other reason is that depending on the size and the importance of the category for the retailer, they'll take more time and more consideration in evaluating all the opportunities in new products and existing products. Um, there are there are categories that are differentiated at retail, um, re, depending on the retailer's strategy in the marketplace, that differentiate that retail shop, the, the retail grocer from another. And so the categories and their level of importance vary. Plant-based foods right now is a very, very attractive category. So everybody wants to have the best and most unique and, and most the newest, hottest assortment of plant-based foods. Um, but typically, uh, in order to do a category review, you're going to have to really have a lot of product information. We'll go through this, um, this template in a moment. But you need sales representation, whether that's a broker or, as one of the questions was earlier, somebody direct to make the call. Um, you have to plan, as I said, a, a year in advance, because once the decision's made, it has to go through that entire supply chain. You've got to produce it. It's got to be shipped to the, to the distributor. The distributor has to have the product in inventory in multiple warehouses. And then generally retailers today, they don't do their own resets and they don't, they don't do their own execution. So that a third party come in and those products have to be timed exactly when the shelves are repositioned, the shelf tagging is done and the inventory is put on the shelf. So category reviews, um, you know, and we can talk all day about the data that's required and the elements of information that are required better to have more documentation about the product, the consumer's features and benefits, and, and the reason for being, in addition to all the attributes that we covered a little bit earlier. It sounds like a complex process. Now, yeah, and, and let me just say, it, that's for brick and mortar. As you look to B&B or, or direct to consumer, obviously the shelf space is relatively infinite, right? There's really no physical limitations on space. Um, there is some uh, our issues regard to with regard to timing and regard to seasonality, but I I the, the category review I think is very different from online retailing as it is for brick and mortar, um, particularly because like I said the shelf space is somewhat infinite, and we'll let the consumer decide which products they're going to handle. So I'd say it's a little bit easier to get distribution online, but I'm sure that's changing as we speak. Great. And, and what should um, what should companies keep in mind if they do decide to go the online retail route? What what data can make them more compelling or make them successful there? Well, um, if, if they're fortunate enough to have brick and mortar distribution concurrently, there's there's always that data that's available from the Food Institute, from spins and, and also velocity. Um, but it's really important when you're going to go online and execute a plan and category review and market online is you've identified your target audience. You have to be laser focused because ultimately the spending that you're gonna do online is, is much more um, 
focused than the spending that you would do with a distributor or a supermarket. So uh, do, do you have that laser-like focus? Let's refer to the brand destination statement and the communication attributes. Do you have a performance marketing plan in place? Performance marketing, I guess, is a fancy way for saying search engine optimization, um, uh, search engine marketing, uh, the ability to market products to a, a very focused group, and, and critically, measuring the success of those programs. So, um, and I think that online data and sales of online and, and understanding velocity is a lot easier or faster to read than the traditional brick and mortar data. So those are some of the things that I would think of. And then, and then how do you want to merchandise online? And what types of uh, promotion incentives do you offer? Is it price discount? Is it multi-unit sales? Is it free shipping? Is it, a, is it a membership club with other privileges? And to extend not only the trial of the product, but the ability for the consumer to stay and adopt and convert to that brand. And, and all of those companies, there are a lot of companies out there that do digital marketing. Um, you know, I can think of a few that I favor because they've done excellent work, but they're available to most people to, uh, to identify and, and actually do an audit of, of what their existing business is and what their objectives are. And most, most of these agencies will arrive at a spend and a budget for that. Amazing. And we, we have a, a question from someone listening in, which is, what's the cycle for retail decisions? Um, do retailers make decisions in a certain quarter of the year? And really, how long is that process? How long does it take from when you have your initial discussion to when your product's actually on the shelf? Well, too long. <laughs> but the, the physical distribution, once again, getting back to the fact that you sell a retailer, product goes to the distributor, the distributor stocks it in the warehouse, retailer pulls it from the warehouse and puts it on the shelf. That can be nine months. Um, so for example, if Whole Foods, I'm just using this as an example, was doing a category review in the summer of 2021, those products might be coming to market in March or April of 2022. And in retail, you have to know that November and December are dead months. There's nothing happening in retail to accept new products because of the holiday season. That's where retailers make the vast amount of their profit, whether it's prepared foods, perishable foods, or shelf stable. It is seasonal, but nothing happens in, uh, in November and December. So essentially for a brand to launch, you have 10 months in the year. And just because you're at the earlier part of the year doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna make it on the shelf that year. It's always dependent on the retailer strategy. What categories of our significant importance to them? What categories drive volume and drive traffic? What categories drive shopping basket assortment and add on shopping to incremental purchase? So that's all a calculus that's really hard to describe. Um, but uh, but you know, I, I'm happy to offer what I know when you know if there are any specific questions. Well, what I'm hearing is that uh, startups definitely need to plan ahead and be very focused in order to make sure that they are hitting these cycles and getting in front of people at the right time. Exactly. So let's say things are going great. You've convinced a merchant to take your product. It's on the on the shelf. Um, what's next? You know, what what's important to keep in mind once you're there on the retail shelf? How do you ensure that customers are aware of your product and they actually go out and buy it? Well, uh, I say for brick and mortar, you want to make sure that they buy it. And if they buy it on the shelf or they buy it while clicking through, they, they actually need velocity. Velocity is really critical because the retailer is going to judge your success on velocity. Um, I'd say in a very simple fashion, creating awareness, generating trial, building repeat and adoption. Awareness, trial, repeat, and adoption, and then rinse and repeat. That is a constant cycle to generate new users, to generate uh, volume from existing customers to buy more product, and uh, to continue to create awareness so you build share in your brand. But at the end of the day, retailers, whether they're online or brick and mortar, look at those velocity numbers. They're literally renting space. They're using that space to generate cash and, and, and profits, and they need to use that space most effectively. So hopefully you're creating the right awareness, you have the right shelf position, 
you have merchandising and promotion activity. You'll remember during the pandemic, there was very little, if any, demos. And, and nobody needed displays because people were buying everything they could get. Uh, we're, we're easing out of that slowly but surely. And we're also easing into consumers that are shopping more online and doing less um, in-store shopping. Although in-store shopping will always be there and continue to grow, consumers are finding it easier to purchase their staples online. So it requires you know, less display and less promotion, but it's coming back. Great. Um, so to kind of continue on that, if you are mm -hmm. selling into your retail channel, let's say you're very happily selling at a regional Whole Foods, um, but you obviously are wanting to continue to expand and grow, mm -hmm. what, what should you consider when you're introducing your product into a new channel? Well, I think focus is crucial. I mean, number one, keep your eye on the ball. And I had an old expression from investors that I used to work for on a brand, manage what you got. So instead of thinking about line extensions, instead of thinking about category expansion, be very successful with the existing business that you have, number one. Um, and then, and then de determine from you know, the competition. If, if there are retailers that they're have natural competitors in, seek out those competitors to have your product in distribution. Um, number three, the, the independent cutting edge retailers. Those are the folks you wanna to try to join forces with, whether that's uh, Wegmans, you know, larger chain in, in the Northeastern United States, Publix, which is a large chain in the Southeast, and even Erewhon, which is a smaller six store, seven store supermarket chain in Southern California. These are trendsetters. And so, you know, when, when you're in the marketplace and you want to try to be with the retailers that are, you know, focused on your brand, um, you want to continue to support them, build that velocity, create the story for the next point of distribution. Great. And um, we did have a question come in that relates to what we were talking about just a little bit earlier. So I do want to touch on it now, which is, um, what would you say drives trial in the most efficient way? Is it doing those in-store tastings? Are there other things that you've seen be successful? I could see doing tastings in-store being relatively inefficient. Are there other strategies you've seen brands use? If, uh, the answer to in-store demos, obviously environment permitting and health and safety permitting, once again, um, depends on the chain. Um, certain club stores like Costco have always been very successful with demos. And it definitely drives uh, consumers to purchase the product. They have a chance to experience it. Supermarketing today is a lot different. And, and I'm seeing less and less actual demos in store, with some exceptions of, like I said, some of these boutique retailers. Um, offers, promotion offers, are, are usually the most beneficial for creating trial. Um, you have to challenge that with the notion that a retail price has to be established. So you, you can't put the product on the shelf and immediately drop the price because the consumer is going to think that that's the value proposition that you're offering. So you have to establish your shelf price and then use scan downs or use, use adver advertising typically on, on mobile media and or other social media to generate trial. Great. And uh, we're here at 1040, at least on the... Uh, West Coast. Um, so before we get to audience questions, I do want to leave time for more audience questions. Mm -hmm. I do just want to take a minute to discuss the actual presentation that companies need to give to retailers and would love if you could share, you know, just any tips you have on how to create an effective presentation. Sure. Well, this, um, the template that the, that the audience is looking at is um, publicly available. It's, it's used on the uh, Whole Foods Market um, online template. Um, and uh, they have a portal, a web portal that you can register for. And, um, and so it's a very simple two-page uh, concept. The first page here that identifies the, the actual critical information that you need about your product. So what the product is, what category it's in, the unit cost to the retailer. Uh, typically, there's a distributor markup. And, and again, this is available publicly on the Whole Foods Market portal. And for our purposes, certainly available to our, our uh, viewers. And then on the bottom half of that left-hand side are our selling points, features, and benefits. 
So, um, and if there's a, a second page to that that we could go to, it would illustrate it a little more closely. But um, once again, that product is available, that template, excuse me, is available on the Whole Foods Market portal. Most um, retailers use this very similar concept. So if you, if you go to the second page, you can see that the mandatory pricing promotion product information and offers, the actual financial offers are in the upper left hand. And then the product attributes and differentiators are on the bottom left, an image of the product and the brand and the UPC code. Um, any more than one or two pages, uh, generally without a formal submission is, is going to be you know, just excess baggage, which is different from the brand deck. To be clear, the brand deck has its use, and a category presentation, category review, or a um, promotional review, new item introduction is, is different and generally requires only two pages. And I, I, I know I've been speeding along through all this. We have a lot of information to cover. So I apologize if uh, we, we've just raced through the content. There's a lot to cover today. Um, so thank you so much, Mike. I, I do wanna open it up to some audience, audience questions. If anyone in the audience has a question, please feel free to submit it now. Um, we do have one here, uh, which is, is it a sound strategy for a new brand to, one, launch the product direct to consumer online, two, gather hard data around sales and customer preferences through a strict performance marketing plan and execution, and three, leverage this data in category reviews with retailers? Yes, yes, and yes. Great. We love I mean, your strategy. Now, so that, that's obviously, uh, I think, you know, whenever you can market a product online and gather that intelligence about your shopper, about the frequency of purchase, all of that information really is, uh, makes for a very successful brick and mortar launch. In fact, without a shelf life uh, um, challenge, right, less than 120 days, I would encourage everybody to establish an online presence and consider understanding and gathering that data, just like the questioner had said, because uh, then, you, then you have proof of concept in real life, you're mitigating the costs of distribution, you're managing your working capital, and, and you're easing that cash burn. So yes, yes, and yes. Absolutely, that's, that's fantastic. And um, we, we do have another question here. Um, and I believe this relates to uh, the, some of the slides you were sharing earlier um, around what you should know um, or what customers should know in your plant-based products. And that's mm -hmm. if that those plant-based attributes also relate to alternative proteins. I'm pretty sure that they do, but just wanted to confirm with yes. you. Yes, I, th I think the distinction um, has been in the past, what, what we call whole foods plant-based. When I launched a brand at Whole Foods Market, it was the first vegan exclusive brands or private label in the industry. And it was what we call whole foods plant-based. As, as the industry has evolved and the technology and the ability to create such fabulous uh, new plant-based media um, in ter terms of ingredients, I think you're seeing more processed foods. There, there is some uh, energy around being further processed and the notion that calories from further processed or similar to calories and whole foods plant-based, but no one is gonna deny the fact that consumers want food that tastes good, it's delicious, because if it doesn't, they won't buy it again. So yes, the, the answer is it, it definitely is, um, absolute, it is um, appropriate for um, other processed plant-based foods. Fantastic. And earlier you mentioned uh, brand preference versus difference. And, and could you give us an example of some strong brand preference language versus some differences versus maybe something that's not so strong? Well, that, that's, that, that's a really good question. And, you know, top of mind, I, I, I have a difficult time thinking of, of, a, of a brand, but let me use an example of a category. It's a category that I don't use anymore, but uh, because it contains egg, um, you know, the mayonnaise category has a lot of different flavor profiles. And so each of those flavor profiles, and I won't mention any national brands or upstart plant-based brands, each of those brands has a flavor profile. 
So if the flavor profile is attractive, all things being equal, what's the point of preference? Is it sustainability? Is it the package design? Is it the communication? Is it the value proposition? So point of difference could be just strict flavor or packaging system. Point of preference drives more into the brand ethos. So I don't know if I was able to answer the question. I'm trying to think top of mind if there's a brand that, you know, that resonates with me that that's a point of preference, but all things being equal and flavor profile and packaging, there's a reason that people choose and have a preference for brand. And it typically revolves around some of those things that are hard to measure, the brand integrity, the brand ethos, the sustainability more than ever today that people are looking for that makes the brand a good steward of our resources. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. Well, thank you for that answer, Mike. Um, I really enjoy this next question, which is how do you negotiate merchandising and marketing with the retailer? Um, for example, Beyond Me uh, has done a really amazing job of insisting that they're being sold in the meat case alongside uh, conventional meat products. Um, is this an opportunity for manufacturers to lead with some evidence-based merchandising? Yes, you know, that example of Beyond Meat finally uh, enabling, being enabled to merchandise, I have firsthand knowledge of that. Uh, the founder of, of Beyond Meat and actually the executive chairman is a, is a good friend of mine. And for, for a very long time, I would say it was the better part of a couple of years, they were trying to convince the meat buyers to merchandise the product in the meat case. And there was tremendous resistance because obviously the meat buyers want to sell meat, but the grocery category manager had the responsibility for plant-based foods. So it could have been a dairy product versus a meat product. And, and so we had the clash of the titans, right? The, we had the clash of the category managers trying to take responsibility for that very valuable space. Um, in, in, in answer to this question, I, I think it's very, it's, it's really a challenge because as these plant-based analogs replicate other foods, there, there is some adoption. It just takes time. And, and I think the, the meat eaters, the omnivores are recognizing that it's okay to trade off on a plant-based product. So as category managers and merchants understand that, they're more likely to merchandise those products in a similar space. Um, but in terms of actual merchandising and, and convincing a merchant to carry the product, uh, let me refer to one of those earlier questions. Data, uh, the ability to sustain velocity, whether it's on the shelf or online, and, and the reasons that a merchant will want to make space in that category, not just because of the return and, and the profitability, but in some cases, the retailer wants that product or that brand as a part of their assortment to draw that consumer in. So plant forward consumers, sustainable consumers, you know, maybe some years ago, you'd find them going to Whole Foods and Sprouts. But now you're finding them going to all mass marketers expecting that assortment. So the answer is, is, is complicated. I would just say that it's, you know, have compelling data, have a reason for being, and, and make sure you're focused on who that consumer is so the merchant knows they're going to get an incremental sale from the product. Yeah, and I would say um, GFI has definitely published some research around this, um, and particularly looking at how uh, plant-based products, alternative proteins really do sell better. Um, for example, plant-based milk sells much better now that it's being sold next to the milk in the refrigerated section uh, versus in the aisles. Um, to move along, uh, how do promotions work, Mike? Um, is it the retailer that puts your product on sale? What's the brand's involvement in that? How do they? How does this impact margins? Um, are you using promotions to drive trial? Uh, give us the give us the overview on promotions. The brand owner ultimately offers the retailer promotions. Retailers like to promote products as often as they can, but I would say three to four times a year, perhaps five times a year, depends on the category. Those categories generate dollar volume. They generate an incremental transaction. They generate a larger shopping basket. So those are the retailer's objectives, right? Move product, turn inventory, generate cash. And in some cases, promote products that are unique to that specific retailer to create a competitive advantage. 
it's incumbent upon the brand. Those brands um, typically offer what's called an off invoice or a discount off the invoice to an intermediary, to the distributor. And in some cases, based on the relationship the distributor has with the retailer, they'll pass along that, that allowance. In some cases, you can do direct scan backs with retailers, which is um, having a relationship with the retailer that allows them to reduce the price of your product as it goes through the cash register. They keep account of that and then they bill back the, the manufacturer for those discounts on a, on a scan. Sometimes you can do the scan without a distributor discount. Sometimes it requires a distributor discount to stimulate the, the retailer to do a scan back. That, that's the actual price reduction. Then there are other promotions that are you know, multi-unit product sales, you know, a two for a buy one, get one, typically manifested in a discount. So you sell two units at the price of one, it's offered as a scan back or a credit at sale. Um, and then, and then there's lots of on, I assume there's lots of online and mobile offers, which I, I don't happen to be personally familiar with. I'm sort of a, the brick and mortar grocer, um, but, but they are essential. The brand owns those. And it depends, the, the second part of that question is, you know, what categories are being promoted and, and, and how frequently are they being promoted? And I think that is really incumbent upon just knowing what the retailer strategy is. Um, and uh, hitchhiking on another question I think that popped up is how do you know what categories retailers want to innovate in or where is the most fertile ground for innovation? And I would say just in general, without looking at the data, right? I have no data to support this generalization. My, my intuition tells me that categories that, that need renovation, categories that have for example, I think um, just recently there's a new brand of mac and cheese that came on the market that's all plant-based with a cheese analog, maybe cashew-based cheese, and and targeted uh, not at kids and not at a at a, at a budget-conscious um, consumer. Those are categories that are ripe for renovation, and retailers obviously want to bring in energy and enthusiasm to categories that are a little tired, bring people back to the center of the store. So. The answer about where this fertile ground is for new products, it really varies. I always encourage one thing, it's really critical, I didn't mention this. I always encourage people to go into the store and look at the store through a retailer's lens. Don't look at it as a marketer and as a brand owner. Try to go into a store, whether it's one of those supermarkets or natural food stores or chains, and look at the shelf and look around the perimeter of the store and understand why and how retailers merchandise their products. And you can ask. You can ask um, team members, you can ask store clerks and, and associates in the stores, you know, why do you do this this way? That's the best way to gather intelligence about how to market and promote your brand. Well, I'm glad that we uh, had time to share, share that tip. Um, we probably have time for one more question. So this is around packaging. Um, and it's really around how how often should brands revisit their packaging? Is it there a way is there a way for them to test it in a retail environment? Um, what should you really know when designing your package? It feels like packaging is critically important in telling your brand story. Um, what 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 do you have to share there? Well, um, that's a whole other day of discussion. But let me see if I can boil. You have it down. three minutes. Boil, you know, boil the ocean <laughs> down to that. So. Obviously, when designing the brand, the brand destination statement obviously speaks to packaging. So it should all be consistent. Everything communicates. So develop a consistent brand destination statement. Let that help drive the objectives of a package designer. If you got your packaging done already, I, I don't really see the need for a packaging refresh. If it, I, I call the elements of package design the holy trinity what it is, what it does, and how it works in an eighth of a second. That's what you need to remember about package design. Online, whether online or you know, brick and mortar, you, you have a fraction of a second to draw someone's attention to that brand. If it's brick and mortar, make sure the attributes are, are well established. You don't want them on the bottom of the package where a channel marker will cover up some of that most important information. If you're doing colors, you want to make sure if it's a frozen or refrigerated item that it shows up in different light behind a glass door. 
so that it doesn't conflict with the glare or some of the ambient light in the supermarket. Um, if it's online, you want to be able to communicate differently. And again, the brand ethos is so important online. What that brand stands for, what the packaging stands for, what commitments you make to the environment and to organizations that you feel are, are aligned with your, with your brand's uh, constituents. But package design is very subjective. Um, make sure you have the key elements in place. Um, uh, attractive you know, colors, it's all very subjective, but what it is, what it does, and how it works in an eighth of a second. And if you can get that right, I think the rest of the package design will take care of itself. Simple, very simple. Easy. <laughs> Well, it looks like this is all we have time for today. Um, Mike, thank you so much for sharing your time and sharing your expertise with us today. We really My appreciate pleasure. it. It's been a pleasure. And, and as a reminder, uh, please be on the lookout for the post-webinar email uh, that will contain this recording, some of the additional resources that we mentioned, and of course, uh, check out gfi.org slash events to stay up to date with all of GFI's events and other industry events of interest. Um, I also just wanna remind all of you that immediately following this, we are holding a virtual networking hour via Meetaway. So please join us to have some great conversations with others in the alternative protein space. Thanks so much for attending.